Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 446. Science Faction, your weekly corona update. The numbers stand as follows for today, Sunday, June 7th. Infected worldwide at just over 7 million, with U.S. infection cases around 2 million. Worldwide deaths around 403,000, with U.S. deaths at 112,000. Same caveat I always give every week. All of these numbers are much, much higher. These are just the officially reported numbers. All right, let's get into the week's corona news. First thing to consider, something we talked about a little bit at the end of last week, but must be reiterated, which is, especially in the U.S., how are these protests affecting the spread of COVID-19? So there's some obvious parts. Anybody who's seen video of the protest can see that there's not a lot of social distancing. People are very close to one another. Some people are not wearing masks. There's a huge conglomeration of people who, even if they are, were you know, keeping six feet apart, are moving around. So you're all sharing airspace. This is a respiratory virus. It is going to spread in those conditions, maybe even spread quite a bit. Then you add things to it like physical activities, chanting, yelling, running, getting tear gassed or getting into physical altercations and all of these things will help spread this disease. I am at one point very heartened by the idea of protests against an obvious injustice. And so there is part of me that very much appreciates what's going on there. But I am also very terrified, not only for these people, but for their close relatives. Because if you're going out there and you contract one of these diseases, especially if you're a young person, which most of the protesters are, there's a good chance you will have an asymptomatic case but that you could then bring it home to your parents, grandparents, something like that in a nursing home. And that could be very detrimental to people's health. I look at these big gatherings as inevitable clusters. There are some people within those gatherings who are absolutely infected. And it is very unlikely that given the circumstances in all of those things, you would not spread it to somebody else. Even if you are wearing a mask, very few people have a, have access to like N95s that are near 100% effective. So even if you're doing everything right and you wear a mask and you're trying to stay away from people, if you have an asymptomatic case, the chances are you're going to spread it during these times. That does not mean that somehow protests should stop. I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just saying these will be huge vectors for big cases, big explosions of this virus in certain places. And it's something that we need to recognize and register and do whatever we can to think about. So maybe if you're out there protesting, maybe you use this as an opportunity to keep distance from people who are immunocompromised or elderly or something for the next little bit because you may very well have it. Maybe if you're out there protesting, not only do you follow good guidelines of social distancing and masks, but you remind your fellow protesters uh, to try and do it as well. Maybe you come out with extra masks to start handing out to people because that is going to really help them. You're saving the lives of the people you are protesting with if you do that and their loved ones. Regardless, I just hope everybody out there stays safe and then be realistic about your exposure level. If you have been in one of these crowds, you are likely to have been exposed. There is a decent chance you have been exposed if you've been around one of these crowds, especially because remember some of the people making up these crowds are there for multiple days. It's not a different crowd every single day, meaning that if there was one person or two people who were infected at a protest last week, they don't necessarily be, need to be at the protest this week to communicate it to you because a whole bunch of other people who shared that protest with them last week will also be at this protest this week. So be really realistic about the chances of you get coming into contact with disease. And if you are somebody who is healthy and young, start treating it as if you have been exposed when you are after you go to one of these rallies. Because while every American has the right to protest injustice, the last thing we want to happen is for you to go do that legal and lawful protest and then head over to go see your Nana at the old folks home and wipe out a group of, you know, septuagenarians. So please, please, please do things responsibly, not only at the protest, but afterwards in terms of your interaction with immunocompromised people. All right, the big science news article about corona hitting around this week was the Swedish experiment and to some extent the failure of the Swedish experiment. So as all the other countries in Northern Europe and ourselves and most other countries instituted quarantines and lockdowns, Sweden tried an interesting experiment. And what they wanted to do is actually not have a strict lockdown. Now, there is a myth out there that they did nothing, and that's not true. They banned gatherings of more than 50 people. They put out social distancing recommendations. They advised people over 70 to stay at home. But they essentially allowed the world to keep going. Schools stayed open. Movie theaters stayed open. Restaurants stayed open. All those stuff stayed open. And their idea was... Maybe because they have such low population density, which they do, they have very low population density, especially outside of Stockholm. 
maybe because of that and their great existing healthcare systems and a generally healthy populace and all that stuff, maybe they could gain a natural herd immunity by allowing their young and healthy to basically contract the virus during everyday life while continuing to keep their economy going. And then keep the old people at home and create a herd immunity system where all these people who are getting mild asymptomatic cases essentially just got them all up at the beginning. So that was the plan. And unfortunately, it has failed miserably. So at the end of May, the death rate in Sweden's neighboring countries, Denmark and Finland, was around six people per 100,000 residents. Now, that's not per 100,000 people infected, six people per 100,000 residents. At that same point in Sweden, it was almost 40 people per 100,000 residents. And again, this happened mainly in their elder communities. It did what it did to a lot of countries, which wiped out huge portions of elderly communities, but it spread much faster in Sweden. So it wasn't that all the people going out ended up dying more, though they did at higher numbers. It just, the dramatic thing was how badly the elder healthcare system suffered because basically you had huge infection rates that were spread very easily to those very vulnerable populations. And it didn't even work in the way that they wanted to because they estimated they would need about a 60% general population immunity to start hitting herd immunity. And studies at the end of May showed that they had about a 7.5% immunity level, which was only about a percentage higher than the countries next to them that had all this social distancing and lockdown. And their economy suffered essentially just as much. So they, in order to try and save the economy and do something different, they were hoping this weird experiment would work. And it has very clearly, unfortunately, been a failure. However... I'm not as on board with the criticism of Sweden as a lot of other people seem to be in the scientific community because I can actually see a realistic plan in which this works. Think about this. Think about the nature of this disease, the asymptomatic transfer, the fact that most of the people who have it don't have negative symptoms, the fact that the young, healthy people who are in general who we want there at work or school or whatever anyway could get it and then theoretically get an immunity to it. You could see a situation where, uh, let's say in an in a ideal world, you wanted to do this in a way that caused the least amount of deaths. Well, what I would do is I'd gather all the young, healthy people, everybody who's like under the age of 35, who's never had asthma, who's super healthy, the whole nine yards. And you would almost like send them to a summer camp, like the way we used to have chicken pox parties. You'd almost like send them to a summer camp to go catch this thing and stay away, be quarantined from everybody else for the next month or so. And by the time you let everybody out, you know, you test them on their way out, you make sure they're not still active infections. By the time you let everybody out, you have that entire big group that's essentially totally immune, or at least for a short time, totally immune to the virus. That might have been a successful strategy. I think the problem lies in that lack of isolation, right? They got everybody, they let them mingle around together. A lot of the young people got asymptomatic cases and never even knew about it. But the problem is they went back home and met with their parents or they were in contact with a nurse who was working at a healthcare facility. Whatever it was, we they allowed it to creep into the vulnerable populations. If you did a really good job of infection and isolation, I actually think this is a tactic that could save a lot of lives. If you could get all those young people essentially infected and then over that infection very quickly. And again, this would also take something like a UBI because these people couldn't be working at the time, but you know, they've kind of got that figured out in the Nordic countries. If you could do that successfully, you could create this huge portion of the population, the popula portion of the population that's most likely to catch it because they're out around other people and working and all this other stuff and make them immune, essentially give them a vaccine. And all you need to do is, you know, give them a month's vacation over at a, a Swedish summer camp for 35 and unders. It is not a crazy notion. I just don't think it was done well enough or careful enough to effectively work. And the problem is when you do a crazy experiment with something like this, the end result isn't just bad data that comes out or your hypothesis is incorrect. It's a lot of dead bodies. And right now Sweden is dealing with a lot of dead bodies. Speaking of scientific mistakes, the other big issue that came out in Corona news this week, which I actually think didn't get nearly enough coverage, was the retraction of two major coronavirus papers and one preprint paper and kind of the, the situation around it. So those two retractions were both regarding hydroxychloroquine, and they're both really big deals. So the first is a paper from a few weeks ago in The Lancet that suggested the drug was dangerous to COVID patients. We covered it on this show. It suggested heart issues and a bunch of other stuff. That paper was retracted this week after it was revealed that the data sets were produced from a private company called Surgisphere, and that company would not reveal its data to be reviewed, which is part of science. We need to go check the data. We need to double check that we got everything right. And there were inconsistencies in the data that reviewers did see that made them suspicious and they're refusing to release it. And so basically the paper authors came out and said, well, we can't back up this paper if we don't know the data is right. 
That same day, a second paper was retracted from the New England Journal of Medicine that was published about a month beforehand that was also about hydroxychloroquine suggesting it was safe. So we had one paper suggesting it was dangerous that was recalled, one that was suggesting it was safe that was recalled. Both were the exact same problem because both used a private data set from that Surgisphere company, and that Surgisphere company refused to release that data set. They claimed uh, it might infringe on patient confidentiality. We don't know what the actual deal is, if this is fraud or whatnot. But what we do know right now is this is big. Two huge major papers that have determined policy already have been recalled. Their authors have essentially removed their names from them. That's kind of scary because in, it looks almost like this company, Surgisphere, gamed science for a bit in this weird time. We talked about this before in one of our earliest Corona episodes, how we're in a time of pre-print journals where we're not always getting everything from peer-reviewed journals, even though these two were peer-reviewed papers. That means that in this high-speed arena, there are people who could be bad actors or just making mistakes or whatever, leading to inaccurate results. And it looks like we don't know which of those papers is correct, which is not. Obviously, they're contradictory. The drug either is good for you or bad for you when you have the disease, and they say the opposite. But we do know that neither of those papers can stand up to scrutiny without that data being available, and therefore both were retracted. That's really scary because it means that private companies like Surgisphere are in a place to alter important science that will make or lose large companies billions of dollars. So there's a lot of incentive. And obviously that can be a conflict of interest, especially if these numbers aren't able to be reviewed later on by other researchers. These numbers can not only affect policy, but they can literally cost people lives. A third Surgisphere-based paper, now this one had not been peer-reviewed yet. It was on a preprint publication. It was also removed this week. That one suggested that an anti-parasite drug, ivermestin, helped COVID patients. That paper never made it to peer review, but it already kicked off the, a huge boost of popularity of that drug, ivermestin, in South America, meaning it had already affected policy and could have affected people's health. It almost certainly did affect people's health, even though it was just a preprint journal. That means this one company, Surgisphere, may have corrupted the scientific data to such an extent. And again, maybe their data is completely legit and they have good reason to not want to release this because of patient confidentiality. Regardless, their refusal to release it has corrupted the scientific literature to such an extent, because we can't go back and see which of these papers are right, that we don't know the effects certain drugs are having on a population, even though we've done the studies on them. That's terrifying, and it shows that we should be very wary of large private companies that do big data sets that then public scientific institutions use to come to very important results. Lastly, as we brace for the second wave of coronavirus, remember that this is still a very serious illness, and while reopening can be done safely, and I absolutely believe it can be, if it is not done safely, we could see the bulk of deaths occur now after quarantine as our guard goes down especially with the added complication of large protest gatherings, we may be re-entering a world that is actually more potentially infectious than the world before lockdown. And that makes it very dangerous to you and people around you. Remember your social distancing, remember your masks especially, remember your hygiene practices, and don't let other concerns take away from how careful you should be. Stay away from immunocompromised and elderly people, even if you think you're not infected, because again, depending on where you live, it may be that every day from now on that you go out is a day that you're most likely to be infected because you you may very well be more likely to be infected now than before quarantine. And it might, and it is almost certainly will keep getting worse as the second wave comes through. It's up to you personally, not your government, not your mayor, not the president. It's up to you personally to choose not to be a vector for this disease, to kill others, and to do everything possible to help keep the vulnerable people around you safe. Please do not shirk this responsibility just because of outside factors like political unrest, cabin fever, or a sense of complacency around this undeniably dangerous disease. Please, please, please be diligent. Be safe and save some other people's lives. Remember, especially if you're somebody who's under 60 and you're hearing this, somebody who's not immunocompromised and you're hearing this, the life that you save is likely not your own, but that does not matter. You're still saving lives. There's a bunch of vulnerable people right now who are terrified. And while we all have gone through something very big in terms of quarantine and disease and political unrest, those people who are immunocompromised are doing it in much more terror than you can possibly imagine because they have to think of a life ahead of themselves, of dying from essentially suffocating in their own body alone, where their families can't come see them in hospitals as they die a very painful and unpleasant and untimely death because of a disease that can be prevented Please remember those people. 
Please understand that you and the choices you make right now, whether or not you feel like staying in for just one more day instead of going out to your favorite restaurant, whether you really place emphasis on how important masks and social distancing are, the choices that you make can and will save lives tomorrow. So keep that in mind. Don't worry about what the mayor in your town says. Don't worry about what Dr. Fauci says. What you need to worry about right now is making sure you do not become a vector for this, especially a vector towards a vulnerable population. So please, please, please take that personal responsibility upon yourself and act accordingly. All right, guys, thank you so much for this. We have a shortened episode coming out later this week because of my illness. I was simply not able to do a long one and no I call BS this week. I am so sorry, guys. I was literally so bedridden that just taping that one episode yesterday took me out for the rest of the day. We will come back next week with three regular episodes, just like always, as I imagine I'll be uh, good and healthy by then. So thank you so much for listening to this. Please stay safe out there. Please help other people stay safe. And come on back later this week for Science Faction 447. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right.